Uh, what we want to do now is turn our attentions to the business of banking uh, a little bit more specific. We talked about this sort of general banking environment or the climate, and now we want to get down to the business of banking itself. What do banks do? Uh, let's start off by just using this term. Banks are financial intermediaries. There are many different kinds of financial intermediaries. Each one has its own specialty. All financial inter intermediaries stand between, we've got savers and borrowers in a sense. They could do business with each other, but you remember the problems of asymmetric information, transactions, costs, these sorts of things get in the way of these people doing business with each other. Not always. There are times when direct finance works out, but usually the savers and the borrowers don't have direct contact with each other. Savers give their money to a financial intermediary. Here's this intermediary middleman. And then the intermediary moves it along to the borrower under terms that are favorable to each. Okay. And so anyway, dollars in, dollars out. Every financial intermediary, same thing. Dollars in, dollars out savings and loans, credit unions, mutual savings bank, uh, insurance companies. There's a large number of different types of financial intermediaries. They all had their specialty. And we happen to be talking about commercial banks, the biggest of all the financial intermediaries. Okay. Um, when these dollars come in, the dollars go out, there's usually some kind of interest that is paid, and that is definitely true for banks. Banks are bringing dollars in, and they pay interest on those dollars. And then banks send those dollars out, and they charge interest for the use of the dollars. And so a large part of the story for the bankers is to make sure that the interest they charge is more than the interest they pay. Okay, for example, if you're charging, let's say, 7% and you're paying, oh, I don't know, let's say 3%, then prospects for the business are pretty good. This difference between the two, between the cost of funds and then the charge they receive on the use of their funds, that interest is known as the net interest margin. And since banks, like other financial intermediaries, specialize in bringing dollars in, sending dollars out, then the bulk of their earnings comes from that net interest margin. Now, I don't mean to say to you that this is 3% they pay, they charge 7 they definitely have a profit, because what they have to pay out of that is the rent on the building, or if you want, you know, pay for the building itself. They have to pay for the utilities, they have to have the building clean, they have to pay all the employees, all the different expenses that they have are coming out of this. There is a little bit of other activities where they're charging a fee for it. But this net interest margin, I mean, we don't just go automatically, hey, they're making a profit because they have a lot of expenses out of this. <coughs> Over the longer term in the banking industry, the net interest margin is about 4%. And so I use these numbers, 3 and 7 here, for a particular reason. I could have said 13 and 17, but I would keep coming back to a net interest margin of around 4%. That's what it averages in the banking industry over long stretches of time. And the reason for that is that basically they compete for these funds. That is to say, there are the people, the savers that own this money, they have many different places to, to or many different things they can do with that money. And so banks are competing to get it. And then when bankers try to loan that money, the borrowers can get loans from many different places. So there's competition there also. And so competition is regulating how much the bank has to pay, and competition is regulating what the bank can charge. And so it's competitive forces that are setting that net interest margin at about 4%. OK? And so anyway. Um, Let's talk about this. We'll come back to it a little bit more later on. I want to start off by talking about this uh, accounting identity. 
because that sort of leads us into the discussion we want to have. We're going to talk about the business of banking. This accounting identity, assets equal liabilities plus net worth, or for banks, this is called capital. Kind of depends on who it is we're talking about. This identity, and by the way, accounting identity, I use three, I don't even know what you'd call each one of these little horizontal lines, but anyway, three of those, two of them's equal, this is an identity, this is a definition. And what I mean by that is, this must be true by the way things are defined. It cannot be otherwise, okay? And, the, and really what happens is this last item over here will adjust up and down to make sure that this statement is always true, that this equality always holds. Now, as I was saying a moment ago, this account, accounting identity, it applies to every person, it applies to every company, it applies to governmental units, it applies to banks. Everybody it applies to, okay? And assets are the things we own. Okay, so for a bank, it owns lots of different things. It could own loans. Those are a key asset of banks. It could own some cash. It could own some bonds. Liabilities are what we owe to other people. We've got an obligation to give them something back, whatever it is that we have that we receive from them, we have to return that. Okay, and so if we took everything that we own and converted that to cash, you know, you take your house, your shoes, your car, your whatever, model plane collection, your books, your stamp collection, everything, and convert that to dollars, we'd have a dollar amount here. Let's say $150,000. And then we find out, hey, what do I owe you and you and you? And let's say this is $110,000. Well, then anything that's left over falls into this category of net worth. What we normally would say for a person is, rather than net worth, that's your wealth. So when we say is somebody wealthy, we mean this thing over here. And by the way, as I was saying before, this statement has to be true. So if we know this is 150, this one's 110. Assets 150, liabilities 110, what we owe other people, then this has to be 40, right? This has to be. And so for most people, we would say, oh, that person's wealth is $40,000. For a company, we would say, oh, its assets are, I don't know, $150 million. Its uh, liabilities are $110 million. Its net worth is $40 million. For a bank, usually this term would be capital. Those all mean the same. It's that last item over there at the last, whether it's wealth or net worth or capital. It mainly depends on whose accounts we're looking at. Okay. Now, there are other statements in accounting, other uh, uh, measures of activity that are important. There's an income statement, and it has to do with the flow of funds through a bank, the flow of dollars to, well, not just a bank, but any company, but how they're generating revenues, what their expenses are, what their profits are. But this is what they are holding. Yes, sir? If you're paying off something? Well, if you, let's say you go buy a house. I go to the bank, I borrow $80,000, I buy a $100,000 house, okay? That house is in my name, so that $100,000 house would be an asset, but then my, what I owe on that house would be a liability. And then the difference would be the part that I own, that I paid for out of my own net worth, or out of my wealth, and that would be, in this case, $20,000, okay? Anyway, so we've got this accounting identity. 
And it sort of relates back to this little picture I drew a few minutes ago. Here's the thing. This is, these are sources of funds. And we'll call this uses of funds. And so when we come back over to this accounting identity, how does a bank get money? What are its sources of funds? And the answer is, on the right-hand side of this identity, it gets money from other people, and it gets money from owners. And so when we say, what are the sources of funds for banks? Owners, and then others. Mm, I'll say depositors, and lenders. And so when these funds flow into the bank, the bank owes this money back, right? The depositors and lenders say, here, I, take this money. And the banker says, I owe you. And when they say, I owe you, that's a liability. Are you with me on this? The dollars flow into the bank. They owe it back. You put money in a bank into the checking account. That's a source of dollars for the bank, but the bank owes you. The other possibility is that the owners of the bank say, hey, just at first it's some investors that say, hey, let's get together, let's start up a bank. You've got to come up with some money of your own if you're going to be an owner of that bank. And so this is the bank's capital where we owners contribute something to the bank's operations. We're providing funds to that bank. And so now the bank's got dollars coming in from these various sources, from the owners and from others. And then the bank puts those funds to use. Here's the uses of funds. And what they do is they purchase assets. Okay, and so what I'm saying to you is that this whole discussion of sources and uses of funds for banks, like I say, we can draw a little picture like this, a box and dollars coming in, dollars going out for any financial intermediary. And so when we're talking about sources and uses, we can relate that discussion of sources and uses back to the balance sheet, to this uh, accounting identity. Now, there is a little bit more to the story than that because if we talk about a bank, let's say we own a bank, we've got a building over here, and then there's some equipment inside, right? Well, those would be assets that we have as well. Oh, we, we own this building. Well, that's an asset, but it doesn't really get back to this idea of sources and uses of funds. So there are a few assets that we are not going to be talking about. The assets that we are going to be talking about are those that relate to how, you know, this sources and uses of funds. But this, all this stuff that, and I know most of you have had an accounting class, but the stuff that you have learned in accounting, it relates back to the nature of the banking business. By the way, let me also just mention though that when depositors or owners hand money over to the bank at that instant before they do anything else, they have some assets. If they hand, somebody hands over cash, here's $100, that banker has assets at that moment. And so now it is a matter of taking those assets, those cash assets, and turn it into some other asset that earns interest. But anyway, it's the management of those assets that has to do with the uses of funds. So anyway, we want to talk about these particular issues. Um, let's talk first about the sources of funds. And I'm going to talk about four different sources of funds. I'm sorry, not four. We're going to talk about three different sources of funds. Deposits, borrowing, and then capital from owners. <coughs> 
First of all, let's start off with transaction deposits. People put money in the bank. The banker receives those dollars. Now the question is this. Basically, what is the understanding between the depositor and the banker? And not only the understanding of how long am I going to leave the money there, but also under what terms and conditions can I have this money back? And so with transaction deposits, basically what happens is you hand the money over to the bank. There is no particular maturity date on those dollars because you're going to use these dollars for transaction purposes, and that means whenever you want to go out and buy something. Okay, it could be five minutes from now, it could be five years from now. So there's no particular maturity date, and for you to use these in transactions, you've got to be able to roam around the countryside, not where you've got to get back to the bank, but usually a checkbook or a debit card, something of that nature. And so the two types of transaction deposits we've talked about before are demand deposits, and now accounts. And that term now account is an acronym, the now is, negotiable order of withdrawal. Holy mackerel, that's exactly what your book says. What a surprise. Anyway, so we put the money in the bank. There's no particular maturity date on it. Just leave it as long as you want or take it out as quickly as you want. And you can use this in transactions, like I say, th by having a check or by a debit card. Or the debit card can typically be used as an ATM card you know, and uh, go overseas or in your hometown or any place else you want to go and use a card and gain access to your money uh, in the middle of the night or whatever, okay? Demand deposits are the original checking accounts at banks. And there is a law called Regulation Q. I shouldn't say a law, but a regulation. And this Regulation Q says the interest rate on these demand deposits is 0%. The Federal Reserve regulates banks, and it's got a regulation called Regulation Q that sets maximum interest rates. Maximum interest rates, not a minimum. And it says, you, you bankers may not pay more than 0%. That's a maximum, right? But it's very low. It used to be, we don't have these anymore, but used to be Regulation Q set maximum interest rates on nearly all accounts at banks, deposit accounts. So on checking accounts, 0%. And then there would be a, sm a small savings account, 4%. A savings account with a three-month maturity, 4.5%. With a six-month maturity, 5%, and so forth. And virtually any type of account you or I would have at a bank Regulation Q would set the maximum interest rate. Why? To prevent banks from competing. <laughs> Which is kind of a funny idea right now, but I told you about uh, Glass-Steagall and how there were these ideas that came out of the Great Depression and people sort of would make up their own story about what caused the Depression. One of the things they said was this. Let's say you're a saver here and you've got some money and then here are some banks and the banks are saying, hey, why don't you let us hold your deposit? And you say, hmm, maybe so. And the banker says, I'll tell you what, I'll pay you 2% interest rate on your deposit. And then in theory, this is all nonsense, of course, uh, but this is the story. In theory, this banker would say, hey, I'll give you 2.5%. And, and this one would say, no, 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 give it to me. I'll pay you 3%. And then round and round it would go. Four, four and a half, five, five and a half, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty. Until finally they had bid up the cost of funds so high 
that they went out of business. And so it's this competition, competition between banks, and competition between would be competition. Competition between banks would drive up the cost of funds. That's the theory. And the cost of funds would be so high, the banks would fail. And we've got to stop that from happening. You remember a while ago, I had this net interest margin up here. And I had like, what, 7% and 3%. And then we've got this net interest margin of 4 Well, the theory would be, oh, this rate would be competed up so high to 4 to 5 and so forth until the banks went out of business. There is no net interest margin. Now, the economics of this are terrible because if you're running this bank and you said, hey, I'll pay you 3% on your account, and then some other bank said 3.5%, then your bank would just go, okay, we pass. I mean, we don't see gas stations stand out there and just bid up the wholesale price of gasoline until they go broke. What they say is, you know, that's all I can afford to buy it, whatever, $3 a gallon. Pass? You want three and a half? No. Any other company, like if there's a restaurant and somebody shows up and says, hey, I'll sell you potatoes, $50 a pound, you say, no thanks. But the theory is these bankers were just so, I don't know, addle-minded, so unable to manage their business, they would compete up the price of funds trying to get these deposits and put themselves out of business. And so then the idea is, well, then we can't have that. This is the kind of stuff that happened that led to the Great Depression. We can't have that. So what we'll do is we'll just keep these banks from competing and set a maximum interest rate. None of you can pay more than 2% or 3 or whatever number. The number would change over time gradually, not very often. But we're going to set a maximum interest rate, and that will present, prevent the banks from competing for deposits. Pretty much all deposits. So what did the bankers do? Then they said, well, and I use two here, but let's make it four. If we can't pay more than 4%, I still want that deposit. And I can't say four and a half, pardon? A crock pot or a toaster or a clock radio or, you know, a pet turtle or whatever it is that would cause you to bring that in. TV set if you bring in $100,000, you know, this kind of stuff. So they still competed, just not with interest. And so this was just a totally ridiculous idea. Okay, it was ridiculous on its face, but that's where we got Regulation Q. By the way, I'll tell you who liked it. The bankers liked that, right? They liked saying to this guy, I'm sorry, the law will not let me pay you anymore. And then all the other banks are saying, yeah, we can't pay more either. And so then this is the bankers are happy because the savers aren't getting a higher interest rate. At first, at least, eventually they turn to the crock pots and the toasters and so forth. Yes, sir? Regulation Q still exists, but it's sort of like that Glass-Steagall where it still exists, but we've gone through and crossed out lines of it. And so Regulation Q is there and could always then be brought back, but r right now it only regulates the interest rate on one particular account, and that is a demand deposit. Oh, that is a demand deposit. Okay. Okay. No, your demand deposit does not pay interest. Your now account pays interest. Okay. See, you're just jumping ahead. So what happened was this. Back in the early 1980s, bankers just said, hey, you know, we've got this big problem. We always liked this before where we could not pay higher and higher interest rates and compete for funds. But the problem is this. Back in the 1930s when Regulation Q was created, that was pretty much it, just banks. And they said, well, let's don't compete. And so they went to their regulator and they said, well, we support Regulation Q. But then what had happened by the 1970s and 1980s was there are a lot of other types of financial institutions out here, unregulated financial institutions like mutual funds. And the mutual funds were saying, this was a period of high inflation. You remember we had that nominal interest rate 
equals the real interest rate plus the expected inflation rate. I'll just put a P there for expected inflation rate. Well, in the 1970s and early 80s, there was a lot of inflation. This was high, and that being the case, interest rates were high. And so what happened in like 1980 was mutual funds were saying, hey, if you'll give us your money, we'll pay you 12%, 15%. And if, bank, if the mutual funds are paying 12 or 15 percent, then people take their money out of a bank account and put it in a mutual fund. And then the bankers are going, man, this is not fun anymore. People are taking their money away from us and giving it to somebody else. And then they went to the regulators and said, please, please, please get rid of Regulation Q. And the Federal Reserve said, no, okay, we'll get around and do that soon. And then the Congress passed the law. And they said, basically, to the Federal Reserve, we want you to come up with some new kinds of accounts that are not subject to Regulation Q interest ceilings. And so anyway, in the early 1980s is when this was all phased out. Okay, two laws, by the way, on now accounts, and then we're going to talk about non-transaction accounts. In 1980 and then 1982, we got two different sets of laws passed, and what they did is phased out these Regulation Q interest rate ceilings, or maximums, on all accounts except demand deposits. You want to know what these laws were? Well, you already know about this one. Does anybody remember? Garn, St. Germain. I told you about it earlier. I said that it was Garden St. Germain made it possible for a bank to take over a failing bank in another state and cross state borders. That law also was part of this whole phasing out of Regulation Q on all accounts other than demand deposits. And then <laughs> in 1980, see if you can keep up with this, DIDMCA. The Depository Institution Deregulation and Monetary Control Act of 1980. Say that three times fast. You don't really need to know this, but I'll say it again. Depository Institution <coughs> Deregulation and Monetary Control Act of 1980. So those two laws were responsible for phasing out Regulation Q. The first one said to the Federal Reserve, phase it out over a six-year period. And then two years later, the Federal, then the Federal Reserve said, okay, phase out Regulation Q over a six-year period. You know, by six years from now, that's the deadline. It's all going to be done. They say, okay. And so two years later, the Congress came back and said, you haven't done anything in two years. And the Federal Reserve said, you gave us six years. And they said, okay, well, we're not anymore. Do something this year. So anyway, one of the things that happened in 1982 was we got now accounts you said that you had a checking account that pays interest. What's it pay, like about one-eighth of a percent? It pays 5% for a lot of non-transferable money. That's pretty good. I'm going to have to switch some money over to the bank you do business at. Anyway, so a now account, basically what happened was this. It was, hey, we need to have a checking account that pays interest, but there still are demand deposits. What are we going to call this? And then they try to come up with a name. We can't call it demand deposit because demand deposits pay no interest. So this negotiable order of withdrawal, it's an order of withdrawal. That's like a check. And the negotiable part is you can go out and present it to somebody in the marketplace and get something for it, get cash for it or whatever. So anyway, this was just kind of a made-up name. It pays interest. And I'll say interest rate greater than or zero percent. Greater, uh, greater than or equal to, but greater than typically. Usually pretty low rates. It's up to the banker within broad ranges. In theory, in, well, no, not in theory. The law says this. Business checking accounts are demand deposits. Business checking accounts are demand deposits. And then personal checking accounts can be either. And usually what the banker says is this, we want you to maintain a certain balance 
maybe a thousand bucks, but it varies from uh, bank to bank. We want you to maintain a certain balance and then we will pay you interest. And if you're going to have a small balance account, no interest. That's usually the way it works, but for a person, that's totally between you and the banker. They can charge whatever fees they want or have whatever conditions they want. You can say, no thanks, or I'll take the deal. I don't want to spend too much time with this, but business checking accounts, I said, must be demand deposits. The only thing is, that is almost meaningless for this reason. Let's say you have a business, and you go to your banker, and you say, hey, I want to open a checking account. Not I personally, but the business. We want to open a checking account. And they say, okay, demand deposit. And then they say, 0% interest. You say, oh, that's not very friendly. And then they say, that's what the law is. And then you say, well, I didn't ask what the law is. I said, that's not very friendly. And then the banker says, I got an idea for you. We'll take your money. Let's say we'll take your $100,000 or $1 million or whatever, and we'll put it in that checking account. And then just one minute before we close the doors today, we're going to take all your money out of that checking account and buy a bond for you. And you say, what's the purpose? And they say, well, you're going to hold that bond overnight and earn interest on it. And then in the morning, one minute after we open our doors, we're going to basically buy that bond back from you and put the money in your checking account. And so you'll have it available for writing checks. But you'll be earning interest too. They call this a repurchase agreement. And this is a loophole for getting around Regulation Q. Yes, sir? How much money do you have to have for them to do something? How much do you have to have for them to do that? That's between you and your banker. I mean, you know, a banker might just say, I can do that for you, and maybe you have thousand dollars in your account but they might say we're not gonna and by the way if I were your banker I'd say a thousand bucks are you kidding me and so then there'd be some minimum but the point is it partly depends not just on that but also the rest of your relationship like if you are a business and you've just got a thousand dollars in your checking account that's small but they might still give you that service because it might be that you're borrowing money from them and paying them a million dollars in interest a year and so they care about the overall relationship and making you feel good about them. But if we were just talking about a tiny little account, you'd say, I don't care. Yes, sir? It's a repurchase agreement. Uh, basically what they do is this, is at the end of the business day, they sell you a bond, and then the next morning they repurchase it. So this is a repurchase agreement. And like I say, it allows the banker to comply with the law, but it also allows the banker to pay interest. And so, but the banker really isn't paying interest. Really, you're earning that on that security. So anyway, here are our transactions accounts. Both of these, the balances, are included in M1. You remember our M1 money supply? And here's half of the M1 money supply is demand deposit balances and now account balances at banks. And we're talking of around, what, $700 billion? And that's a rounded off figure, but around $700 billion. Okay, questions about any of this? Now, the other kind of account or deposit I should say in a bank deposits in banks are non-transaction and let me just list a few of these we don't want to spend too much time with them but passbook savings passbook savings accounts are what most people had as their first savings account at a bank. In the old days, you actually, you know, before the computers and all that stuff, you actually got a small little book called the passbook, and you'd take that in and give them, you know, $2 deposit or whatever, and then they would take this little book from you and enter that in, $2 deposit on whatever the date was, and then they'd initial that, and then you could take this home and, you know, get it out and study it and sleep with it and stuff like this and have little dreams about what you were going to do with your $47 when you build up to that balance. 
and then as time gone by, sometimes we'll hear these referred to as a statement savings account rather than passbook because the idea is now you just get a statement in the mail. Okay, but in any case, these do not have a particular maturity date. You put the money in the account. There's no checkbook and there's no, you know, like you just cannot go out in remote locations and buy stuff with this money. This is in a savings account. You can go back at the bank and get your money, but it is not a transaction account. Okay, there are MMDA equal money market deposit accounts. With a money market deposit account, it is essentially the same as a state, uh, as a passbook savings account. There's no maturity date, not a particularly high interest rate, and you have limited uh, checking privileges. Just a certain number of transactions within a month, I think the number is six, and that being the case, there's not enough checking account privileges for this to be a normal demand deposit now account kind of a deal. Okay, but if you need some money, you could write a check at some remote location. And then savings and time deposits. Let me take out the savings. I'll just say time deposits and CDs. And these are accounts that have a maturity date any place from, and this is negotiable what these maturity dates are. It may not feel like it to you. If you walk into the bank and you've got a thousand bucks and they've got something up on the wall, you might think it's not negotiable, but you can ask to see a banker and say, I want to leave this money for five days. I want to leave it for five years. But anyway, there's no general rule but there is a maturity date on this. We'll talk more about this next time, and here's why we'll talk about it some more. This is in the trillions of dollars. This is huge, the time deposits and CDs. Okay, see you next time. So long.